Hi, everyone. Do we have our uh, late nighters with us tonight? HGC surprise live. You'll never know what we're going to be doing uh, during this trial. Right, John? And we'll probably have a lot of late nights since we're yeah, late night, this. impromptu, spontaneous surprise lives. Yep. Here's yes. one. Yeah. And today we're doing this in front of a live studio audience. Kind of just kidding. I, uh, my, uh, my roommate is here listening. So, <laughs> um, and it's not also the fine studio. Do you mean like people scattered all over the world? <laughs> that's, that's a I weird mean, studio. I mean, a beautiful place where I am staying for the next oh, few weeks okay, so, while, gotcha. while covering the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. So. Okay. So I'm not in that studio then. I'm just yeah. Kidding. Hey everyone. It's so good to see so many familiar faces here. Thanks for being here. We have to talk about something that we haven't yet discussed, which is last week, Lori Vallow Daybell. Lori Daybell had um, what I would call a meltdown, a breakdown in court, something we've never seen before. You know, I saw it. I was there. Uh, of course, many of us don't know what was happening behind the scenes, but let me let me take everyone back there and explain what I saw from this courtroom. We all had a 45 minute lunch and we all rushed back to the courtroom because if you are late back to the courtroom, they will shut the doors on you and you do not get to go into court. And once we were all back in there, court usually starts promptly and it wasn't starting and it wasn't starting and everybody was wondering what was going on. And uh, this went on for quite a while. There were many people going back and forth to this uh, door behind the judge uh, where, which is the door that Lori Daybell usually comes out of. And everyone was whispering. She, she finally, um, she does not come out, but the prosecution and the defense come out. The jury is sent back. Uh, we need to have a discussion without the jury here. And then the defense, um, Lori's defense states that their client is, um, not well, that she's emotional and that she does not want to be present for uh the rest of court now now maybe i need to i need to also set the stage as to what we were discussing this was the hardest day of the week um as far as emotions go in court this was tuesday we were going over um the autopsies of jj and tylee and tammy uh, people were crying jurors were crying it was emotional it was upsetting uh you know victims were in the the stand this was um this is an awful day. And uh, of course, when she said that, everybody uh, sort of gasped in the courtroom. And you can imagine how the victims must feel. You know, here you are on trial for this, the murders of your own children, you know, beautiful children, and yet you don't want to be in court. Well, we all have to look at these photos and see what was done to these children. And you want to waive your presence in court. <coughs> And so the, the, the defense argued their side, the prosecution argued their side. The arguments lasted for quite a while. Uh, Judge Boyce um, mentioned a lot of case law and then, then decided that, you know, Lori Daybell needed to be present. She walked out. And I've told this all to John. You look so excited. Is it because you're bored? Are you? <laughs> you, you? By the way, you look like you're looking up a little bit. Are you? Oh, is you, my camera? Am I? Thank you. Um, yeah. Am I not looking at my camera? See you guys? You're not. So, yes, you're looking at, I don't know what you're looking at, but it's. it's John's off. like the husband when I have <laughs> lipstick on my teeth. He's like, I'll just wait for the right moment to tell her. Yes. I, my, it looks like my camera is not right. Okay. Oh, that's not right either. So anyway, um, then while I fix this, da, 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 um, oh, my camera's not plugged in, so I'll just look down at all of you. This is my camera uh, angle. Anyway, Lori, I see I'm looking at my camera now. Anyway, Lori uh, came out. She was very, very upset and uh didn't look at anyone didn't make eye contact for the rest of the day she sat like this so she was in her chair and she was sitting like this down um 
towards the end of towards the end of there the were day, some there were some some people were tweeting and even you had said that it wasn't clear if she was sleeping or not right or if she was right so at the beginning it was clear that um gosh guys I can't even plug this on. At the beginning, it was clear that she uh, was just pouting. She was distressed. I don't know what emotion she was feeling. That's why you're here. Uh, she she looked distressed, and I think uh, at, towards the end of court, she didn't ever look up or make eye contact for the rest of court. And uh, you know, until the end, like we had rec we had like a mid afternoon recess. We came back. She was still. I don't know. Like I said, it was pouting or distressed. And then towards the end of the afternoon. She, uh, here we go. Look at that. Towards the end of the afternoon, she looked like she was asleep. I don't think, uh, you know, some people said she absolutely was asleep. I don't know about that. I think she could have been closing her eyes or avoiding people or hiding her face. I, I don't think it's absolutely clear she was asleep, but some people thought she was, um, debatable. But that's, uh, you know, that's how she remained the rest of the day in court. Yeah. So in your opinion, do you think that was the biggest moment of the week? Well, it depends on what the biggest moment of the week is. I would say it was the biggest moment when people want to know what Lori Daybell is doing. Well, was it, now I'm getting a little bit of an echo. I don't. Was it, would you say it was a very emotional moment for you? We talked about it. It was actually an emotional moment for me and I wasn't there, but. Oh, what they were showing in court. What they yeah. were showing, right. The, the pictures of. Yes. I didn't know what you meant. I thought you meant Lori Vallow, Daybell possibly well, her... sleeping or. Um, she, uh, yeah, it was, it was the most emotional day. It was a day I will never forget in court. Um, I cried in court. You know, I, I've shared that. I, I had my game face on. They were showing pictures of everyone, you know, Tylee and JJ's remains. And, um, Larry Woodcock was crying, weeping in his hands. Um, JJ's half brothers, older brothers were there crying. I finally lost. Many people were struggling with this day. It was an incredibly emotional day. Yes. Right. And emotional because they were showing graphic depictions of the bodies yes. of JJ and I guess Tylee to some extent, but Tylee was, to quote Lindsay Blake, Tylee, there was nothing left of Tylee but charred remains. Tylee was unrecognizable, um, which was, it's absolutely tragic. Uh, but to see JJ's face is what finally did me in. You know, as a journalist, you're okay until finally you're not okay, you know. And so, you, you had speculated with me that you thought that maybe he was buried alive. Yeah, I didn't know if I wanted to say that publicly because I don't know. Right. These so are the things John and I speculate. Yeah, these are the things John and I speculate about. I think more so I speculated and understood that it was probably much worse that he struggled a lot more than we ever. Right. I, I, in the in the in the best world, you want to imagine he was drugged. Okay. And something happened, but when you saw his face, and you saw you know the duct tape going across his mouth. Yeah. And then you think that was that to stop him from screaming, and then we heard that he had bruises on his arms, which I can only imagine are defense wounds. Um. Right. Your worst nightmares, you know, the worst thoughts come. So I, I, you know, I'm digging a little deeper into that so that our listeners can understand why it was so emotional and why it was so hard, but also that will set the stage for the discussion we're about to have. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Because, and, and, and Lara <laughs> Ferris is in chat. I just want um, everyone to know that Lara Ferris is a, is a hidden gem and she was actually sitting next to me. So. Okay. She, on the, you can know on the too. Day. Here. It's good to see you, Laura, here. I'll never forget that day, and she probably won't either. Yeah. So, so there's been people have asked us, we, you know, we unfortunately we skipped over this important moment 
the other night in our lives. So that's why we're here tonight. We're revisiting this and it, it's something I think we should talk about. So, so I think hopefully we set the stage there. I think the, the important point that I want to make about what you just discussed about seeing the pictures of the bodies and how graphic they were is important for this discussion because I'm going to talk about life stressors. Okay. And life stressors have a huge impact on physical health and mental health both, obviously. But many people have asked us what what was going on with Lori? What was how you know, why was she acting that way? What what was the reason she wanted to skip out of court? And so I'm going to provide an opinion here. You know, it may not be exactly right. I wasn't in court, but I think this will get close to understanding some of what was going on. Okay. And I would start with, so I've talked about this before. I actually talked about this a little bit in the Murdoch case, but there's a, a there's a stress scale. It's, it's by a couple of psychiatrists in the sixties. It was published in 1967. It's called the Holmes and Ray. Ray is spelled R A H E. It's called the Holmes and Ray stress scale, but it's, it was published as the Holmes and Ray social readjustment rating scale. That's how it's officially known. And that's the research that journal that first published it refers to it as the social readjustment rating scale, but it's become a popular scale. It was especially popular, like in the seventies and eighties, it has been validated and it has a lot of a decent amount of research support showing that stressors, the stressors that they tried to quantify have mm -hmm. some later impact on both physical and mental health. In fact, their, their original finding was that, and they looked at over 5,000 medical records to develop the scale, but they, so they developed a number of stressors and they, they, they assigned numerical values to those stressors. And then you, you take this stress scale and you come up with the final score and they found a fairly decent correlation between higher scores and more stress and mental health related problems. So one of the, so I, I just want to go through a few of these. So the number one stressor on their scale is the death of a spouse. So the scale is supposed to apply roughly to the past year or so, but I mean that it's relative, right? If you have a lot of stressors extended over a period of time. There's maybe some cumulative effect to some of the stressors. So, but death of a spouse gets a rating of a hundred. Their second stressor is divorce. That's 76. A jail term is number four. That's a rating of 63 fired from work 47. Anyway, people, it's easy to find the scale online if people are interested, but my point is that, that we have these stressors and sometimes they're hard to quantify, but they made an attempt to do that. And so death of a spouse, 100. One of the things that, that is glaringly absent, one of the stressors that's glaringly absent from this is the death of a child. Yeah, wow. And the reason that's absent is because I think to them back in 1967 and probably today maybe, it's, it's such an outlier. It's such an uncommon event. I mean, we know it happens, of course, but, but I, and I'm, again, this is where a lot of speculation comes in. I think the death of a child is, I would imagine would be the highest stressor. And I would put that at probably 150 or maybe even 200. Okay. Maybe even higher, maybe even 300. But, and so when you think about the death of a child as a stressor and think of, and let's even let's elevate that. Let's, let's say the murder of a child, the murder of a child is probably even higher. Mm -hmm. So, so we have these stressors that we're trying to quantify. And if, if, if we do that, you know, death of a child has to be probably the highest stressor, possible stressor in anyone's life. And then the death of a spouse and divorce jail term. Look at, so let's just look at those, you know, and consider all the stressors that Lori Vallow Daybell has experienced in the past year or two. 
right? She's it's hard to con. It's hard for me because she's the, in my opinion, she's the reason. So that's hard. Right. Right. I, I, but, and we'll get into that. So the, so whatever the cause is, it's a stressor. Okay. The point is that, for example, I'll one, I'll listen to one, of their, one of their stressors is marriage. Mm-hmm. And most people think of marriage as sort of a happy event, I guess, in theory, you know, um, assuming someone doesn't get divorced within a week after marriage, you know, marriage is, which I'm, I'm laughing about that because I just watched, since you've been gone, I've been watching um, Love is Blind on HB. I mean, I'm sorry, on Netflix and it's a crazy show, but a lot of these couples go to the altar and say no. So they're, they don't get married, but they think they're going to get married. And that's stressful. So my point is that if she's the cause of the stressor, it's still a stressor. And, and so I think what's going on here. So if you take a massive stressor and you interject that stressor into somebody's psyche or somebody's world and that person happens to have a personality disorder or mental health issues, much like Lori Mallow Daybell. We don't know for sure what those, what personality disorder she has, but I think it's a, a fair assumption to say that she might have a personality disorder. We know she has some mental health issues because she was deemed to be incompetent at least once, maybe more times by mental health or forensic evaluators, right? So Mm -hmm. I think that for Lori Vallow Daybell, there's been a lot of denial around these murders and the death of her children. And, you know, we've heard, we heard some testimony saying that she saw the, the murders of her children as being merciful in the sense that because they were possessed by evil spirits, that if you could rid them of evil spirits, that somehow that would be helpful to them. So she's actually kind of making this twisted argument that killing her kids is in some ways a good thing to do. But my point is that I don't know that she's come to terms with these murders before. In fact, I think I would argue quite strongly that she's in denial or she has been in denial about what's occurred here, or she's framing it in such a way to justify it or rationalize it. So there's a lot of defense mechanisms here. She's highly defended against the reality of what is occurring here, that her children were murdered, that her spouse was murdered, right? She sees this as part of this fantasy world, right? Where it all makes sense and it all fits, but she hasn't, I don't think to date she's had to deal with the reality of what she's facing here. Mm -hmm. And so this is where the stressor part comes in. You take, you take a massive stressor such as the death of a child that she's been in denial about and she's been defended against, especially if she's a personality disorder. Personality disorders are extremely defended against this type of reality, this dose of reality, and you're introducing pictures, graphic pictures of what occurred. So she can't run away from that. This is in court, right? She can't turn her head. I guess she can, but it's it's in front of the whole court. It's in front of the world. It's a moment that she has to confront. It's a moment where her denial and her defense mechanisms are under siege. She's being threatened by this. So what you have, what you're seeing with her, I think, in court in that moment is a clash between this massive stressor, whether she created it or not, she's still in denial about it. She doesn't see herself as having created it. And someone who's in denial and someone who's extremely well defended, someone who may have a personality disorder, someone who with her mental health issues may be divorced from reality to some extent. And so you have this combustible combination of, of, of a threatening disruptive stressor and someone in extreme denial. 
And the response to that, for most human beings, the response to that and most of, most of our listeners are going to know this, that the response to that is the fight or flight reaction. Okay. So instead of it, it, somebody like Lori, it's highly unlikely that she's going to say, oh, wow, look at that. Now I get it. Now I understand why I'm in this trial. Now I know, you know, that she's going to, she's going to stand up and say, hey, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. You know, I want to take a plea deal because I now I recognize the reality of this. She's not going to do that. So, right. right. So you have a moment here where reality is intruding into this, into Lori's life, maybe for the first time. And, you know, you have to wonder, I have to wonder if the defense has shown her these pictures. I have to wonder if the defense has prepped her for this, right? I My guess is they've tried to, whether she's actually accepted it or looked at the pictures or has been prepared for it. I don't know. I would have to say that seems to me maybe unlikely, but you have this combustible combination of reality and the grim reality of these, you know, ch- children being murdered and someone who's completely in denial and who doesn't want to accept that reality. And so you get fight, flight, or freeze. And that's how people respond to these types of stressors typically, especially stressors that are introduced so suddenly. I mean, again, I don't know what the defense did to prep her, but it seems to me that she wasn't prepared for these pictures. So based on her reactions. So let's go through those. The fight response, you know, I could imagine in certain circumstances where Lori would fight, where she'd right. she'd push back and she'd get angry, right? But she can't do that here. She can't get angry at the judge. She can't lash out at the prosecution. She doesn't have that option here. Yeah, she doesn't. So there's no fight, right? Because that's not an option. That's something that she may be used to doing in her normal life, but she's not going to do it here. Right. So that, that takes us to flight. And that's exactly what she tried to do. She went to her lawyer and she said, I can't handle this. I don't want to be in the courtroom. Can you get me excused for the day? Mm -hmm. That's why. And the judge, they went back and forth. And, you know, some people say, well, she's being manipulative. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say that in the sense that she doesn't want to face the grim reality of what's going on. Uh, Yeah, she wants to avoid... She wants to avoid, I mean, that's what I think made most of us so angry. It definitely made me angry, you know? Right. So is there a manipulative component to that? Sure. But it's also a, it's also a purely physiological reaction to this interjection of reality into the courtroom and facing what she's done head on and these pictures of her kids that are horrific. And she wants to flee. She wants she wants so her normal response because she can't fight. It's flight, so she tries to get out of the situation. Doesn't work. The judge come back and came back and said, "Nope, you got to sit there. You got to face this." So she right. does, and she's also used to being in control and getting her way. Yeah, right. There, you know, assuming she has some type of personality disorder and that she's in severe denial about what's going on. You know, she's, it's some combination of not just a physiological response, a stress response, but also this component of manipulation and getting her way and attention seeking, right? All of that kind of, it's with her, it's hard to really tease out what's going on because there's so much going on, but it's, it's gotta be a combination of some type of, you know, stress response and combined with presumably some type of personality disorder stuff. So she tries, she tries to flee. She's looking at, she tries the flight response. The judge says, no, now she's in a world of trouble. She has to sit there and deal with this. And that takes us to freeze the freeze response. Freezing is often associated with disassociation. Okay. So, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about whether Lori has been abused in the past. And my guess is that there's some history of a dissociative response with Lori. Yeah. And, and, it's, and so the sleeping or the apparent sleeping, that's disassociation. That's freezing in the courtroom. That is shutting off the world and going somewhere else. It could be one of the 
diagnoses for dissociative, dissociative disorders is depersonalization. It could be some version of depersonalization, which is essentially when you have the sense that you've left your body and you've gone somewhere else, like mentally, you're in a different place. And that's Someone mentioned pretending to fall asleep is disassociative. Yeah, right. Exactly. It, or actually falling asleep. If the stress becomes so overwhelming and she's so inundated with the stress response that her body is overwhelmed and can't handle it, sleep is a very common dissociative response. So, so if she was asleep, whatever, whatever, I mean, you were in there, so you, you could see it. And some people thought it was sleep. Some people thought whatever it was, it seems to me that the fight response is not an option. Flight response was shut down by the judge. So she has no choice but to disassociate. And it seems to me that's what was going on. So, you know, the, the obvious question, if that's true, is did she deal with the reality of this situation at all? Right. Did she, was she able to in any way accept the reality of what she was confronting on that day? And I mean, her response would certainly indicate that she wasn't, that she didn't. Right. 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 Yeah. Somebody just said she had no control. Exactly. And that's right. what led, that's what led to these successive stages. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to reflect that maybe she would have fought back, you know, in a normal situation, I could see her getting angry and engaging mm -hmm. in some type of fight response, but obviously that's not an option here. So yeah, she bounced back quickly. Yeah, exactly. So that's the purpose, by the way, that's the purpose of a flight response or dissociation or a freeze. It's called a freeze response. The purpose of that is, is to cope. And it's to continue to remain in that state of denial. It's to continue to keep your defenses up. It's to, it's so, you know, so the other, fl the flip side of this is that Lori is someone who has no resiliency. Yeah. She has no resiliency and no capacity to accept new information and integrate new information and in how she perceives the world. And we, of course, we already know that based on her crazy extreme beliefs, mm -hmm. but Obviously, her belief system is nothing but rigidity. So, so, so it's not it's not unexpected that her reaction would be consistent with someone who's still in denial and someone who wants to push this information out at all costs. Yeah. So I think that's what um, that's what you that to me that's my interpretation. That's kind of what what you witnessed, and um, it would be consistent with how I see Lori and the stressor that was introduced into the courtroom that, you know, that created a lot of emotions and a lot of people. Yeah. Except, except for her. And it, yeah. It made it even worse. It made to see her avoiding and thinking about herself and distraught while, you know, Larry Woodcock and yeah. JJ's brothers weep, you know, it was definitely, you know, I wonder, yeah, I think, I think the defense, I'm sure they tried to prepare her for this. Um, do you think it was shame based too? Perhaps was there some shame involved or the avoidance of shame? We talked a lot about shame with the Murdoch case. Um, if there's a personality disorder, sometimes it's the avoidance of shame. Yeah. I think shame. Yeah. There's, I think there's always shame tucked into these types of situations. I, I don't, I don't, someone who has the capacity to, to process shame in a healthy manner is going to be able to integrate this information better. So obviously it's buried. There's an avoidance here of shame. Mm -hmm. Clearly there's the, that's not part of her worldview yeah. or, or part of her, you know, emotional inventory. Let's say that. <laughs> so the other thing that was often um, triggering, the other thing that was very triggering and that people are talking about, you know, you see her, I keep using the word distraught because I don't know what she's feeling. I don't know if she's feeling sadness or empathy or anger or shame. So I just use this general distraught, you know, she's not happy. She's definitely avoiding something. She won't look at anyone. She, um, right. Is pretending or is sleeping either one. What, 
I think a lot of people get upset about too, is we've seen so little emotion from her, you know, uh, Charles dies, she giggles and says, hello, neighbors. I mean, this is, she seems to be devoid of empathy all the time. So when we see her distraught or when I see her distraught, all I can think is selfishness. Like, what about your children? What about the people you've hurt in this courtroom? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't even know what to ask you about that, but I guess, I, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think that would be consistent with someone with a personality disorder that personality disorders are so rigid and so well defended that typically any challenge or threat to their psyche or to their mental map or, you know, their worldview is going to be rejected out of hand. So, or often out of hand. So it, it's very, very hard to break through those defenses in someone who has a personality disorder. And so I think you're seeing a version of that. You're seeing a version of someone who's trying to shut out the courtroom. She's trying to shut down emotion and she's trying to cling. My guess is she's probably trying to cling to this narrative that she's been clinging to for the last few years about, you know, the apocalypse and right. That's what she wants to hold on to that. And actually in the, you know, in, in talking to Colby about some of this in the past and not recently, but in the past and in the Netflix documentary that played the the call between Colby and Lori, that would be very consistent with what we're talking about that Lori tells Colby, you'll, don't worry, you'll learn the truth, right? Like she's, she's sticking to this narrative that's, that's impenetrable for her. Like she's going to cling to this thing and she's not going to change. And so I think, I think what you're seeing is someone who is extremely rigid and they're just not willing to accept or integrate any of the information that's being presented, which makes sense. That's how she got there. Right. Thank you. Um, what, any idea with what specific emotions you might have been feeling beyond disassociating and me referring to being distraught? I think part of her reaction is an attempt to avoid those emotions. So I, I'd like to say, you know, a normal person I think would experience some sadness but I, I don't believe that she was having that experience. So I, I think, in fact, part of being defended is, is exactly the opposite of experiencing those distress emotions, such as sadness. It's, it's an attempt to, to keep those emotions out. So It's an attempt to avoid it at all costs, in other words. Right, because... If she does that, she's going to have to start acknowledging more of the reality of what happened. And she's going to have to acknowledge that looking at those photos may not fit the narrative that she wants to maintain. That maybe killing a child is not merciful. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's horrific. Maybe it's cruel. Maybe it's damp, right? I mean, the things that normal people would think about this predicament She's not thinking that way. And I think that's one of the that's one of the fascinations of this case is that this is so counterintuitive in the sense that normal people don't respond to these types of stimuli or stressors this way. They respond in a much more humane, compassionate, empathic way, right? And so I think a lot of people just shake their heads and say, what the, you know, what's going on? How is she not able to process this in a decent human fashion. Laura Ferris, this is a great question. And again, Laura was the one um, sitting next to me, just happened to be sitting next to me. We met, you know, that day. And uh, she's at, she, she is explaining that Lori is seating, sit, facing the jury, you know, so being turned means she's not looking at the jury too. Can her seeing their response, the juror's responses, there was one juror crying or, you know, the public's response also be triggering to her? Yeah, sure. I think so. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's introducing more information that she doesn't want to accept. If you, which by the way, yeah, on that issue, how many jurors do you think were, you know, I heard, I heard some reporters saying the jury was on the floor 
you know, shaking and, and wailing in despair, but obviously that wasn't the case, right? I mean, I think that some reporters, <laughs> I <Yeah. think> some... <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to be, you know, I am the eyes and the ears of the courtroom. So I try to be so exact and admit what I don't know or can't be certain of, you know, so uh, maybe I'm like the worst, you know, I'm not like the most exciting one. Cause I'm like, you know, maybe Lori was closing her eyes and pretending to be asleep or resting, you know, where other people like she was asleep. I mean, maybe that's true. Um, some people have said several jurors were crying. I have to admit, uh, and maybe Laura can give her opinion too. In her eyes, everyone has different eyes. Everyone sees different things. I saw one juror definitely crying. In fact, they had to give her a tissue. There were, uh, you know, putting her eyes up to the ceiling, trying not to cry. Um, I would love right. Laura's input too if she wants to share that in chat um but there were how about this whether jurors were fully crying or not there was the jurors were distraught how could you not be how could it's not every day you see the things we saw in that courtroom including right. the reaction that the victims you know it was it was heavy for everyone i don't know if there was one person in there that wasn't feeling very heavy deep emotions whether there were tears coming out of their eyes or not. I, I think it was, it was probably a little baffling to Lori because I don't, I'm just going to speculate here, but I, I don't think she's the best at reading emotional cues. So that would include facial expressions. I think to see some, a juror or maybe jurors, maybe a couple of jurors crying, it must've been perplexing to her. Cause I don't think she's so, yeah. I, I mean, I think she recognizes if there are, we speculated that there might be some, some features of psychopathy. And if, if that's true, you know, psychopaths don't have emotion and they don't respond to distress emotions like tears or like sorrow. So I think it's, it's possible that she looked at that juror and thought, oh, wait, this isn't good. I mean, she, she can process that intellectually, but she's not relating to it emotionally. I think she finds it baffling emotionally. So, you know, so there's this, this dissonance between what she's observing and what she's experiencing and, you know, how she's processing it. So I, I think, yeah, I think that's one thing if she's from a family that didn't show their emotions and if the defense is trying to prepare her for this moment, let's say, and they're going to explain, you know, people are going to be sad. This is going to be hard. And she's just completely avoiding that. And, and yeah, her family has never shown emotion and she's, made sure that she avoids it at all costs and her children are afraid to show emotion in front of her. Yeah, you're right. She would be, it would be very hard for her to understand why they would be feeling things for her children. She is yet to feel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I think she, you know, it's an interesting dilemma because I think she recognizes she needs, she knows the jury has her fate in their hands and she knows she needs to respond in a certain way. That's one of the things that, that say psychopaths or narcissists are really good at doing even though they're not feeling things, they can evaluate those situations and they can give a response that they think is wanted, even though they're not experiencing it or feeling it or connecting with it. They, in many cases, they've learned to recognize some of the signs and to respond in a way that, that they know is important to, you know, to, to provide to someone. So they, they, they understand the way social interactions should occur even though they're not reading the particular, you know, emotional stimuli. Um, Rosita, thank you so much for your earlier uh, support. Uh, Laura, thanks for sharing what you saw in court. Laura Ferris is, is a member. You can look a uh, channel member sharing uh, her observations. Katie is asking, do you think that she f is frustrated that people don't understand that these were zombies or, you know, or that this is what she did that she, yeah. This was a righteous thing and not her children. Could she still be that far into her beliefs? Yeah, I, I think that's part of her defenses, that she's clinging to this narrative that, exactly, that's that's a great observation. She's clinging to this narrative that, that they were zombies and she believes that wholeheartedly. And so she doesn't, right, she's perplexed that the jury can't understand that, that these weren't her kids anymore. They were evil spirits or they were possessed by zombies. Right. And so again, like there's this discrepancy between her perception of the world and a normal person's or, you know, a, a person that has some emotions and 
can process things at a, at a little bit of a different level than her, you know, there, there, there's going to be a discrepancy there. And so I think, again, that's, that's why I think this case is so fascinating to so many people because most of us just can't relate to this or it's so far out there. Yeah. Um, uh, that is a good question. I mean, there's no insanity plea in yeah. Idaho and, um, SW is asking, can she get any psychological help after this trial? She obviously needs help or is in Idaho. It's just jail. I, I think without an insanity plea and she's competent, I think it's simply. Yeah. Prison, right? it's, yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know Idaho well enough. I don't know if there are state mental health hospitals. I presume there might be, or there should be, but uh, good question. You know, if, if she's found guilty and convicted, then I presume in Idaho that maybe they'll do some post conviction assessment and they could recommend some type of mental health intervention in prison. But I, I don't know that she would be committed to like a state mental hospital, you know, right. in, in the same way that someone who was found guilty by reason of insanity, for example, or not guilty by reason of insanity. Yeah. Okay. Um, we were going to keep this short tonight. Uh, and we went a little bit longer than we planned. Um, we always do. We love hanging <laughs> out with our gems yeah. and I've been missing my husband back home. So it's, uh, I get to hang out with him too and process this, trial with y'all. And you know, it, it is true. I want you guys to know, like John and I are having a hard time really, um, finding time to connect on the phone. And so some of our deepest convert our, our most in-depth conversations so far have been live with our gems. So thank you for joining us. So we really are inviting you to our dinner table, but this time to our, our separate, um, our separate, you know, places we're staying while we cover this trial. So thank you for this. I want to respond to this comment here quickly, by the way, that, that Vicki, thank you, Victor, for understanding that. Yeah, I'm not making excuses for Lori. In fact, it's worth noting that in 1982, when John Hinckley attempted to assassinate Ronald Reagan, that was when in Idaho, the death penalty was taken off the table. Oh, I'm sorry, the insanity, insanity plea. plea was taken off the table. And the reason it was taken off the table is because exactly for this reason because they they didn't want the defendants to make you know to make excuses or um for their behaviors for their actions and the, the the way they felt they could do that was to to hold them accountable no matter what even if they were completely you know unable to understand their behaviors and the consequences of their actions or whatever that that Idaho was a state that believe that every defendant should be held completely accountable no matter what. And there should be no excuses whatsoever for their behavior. And, you know, that's, that's debatable, right? They're, they're in, in forensic psychology, there's a lot of debate about that type of thing and whether forensic psychologists by, you know, when we dig a little deeper and look at mental health issues, are we, are we, making excuses? Are we not holding people fully accountable? And I, I don't, I don't really agree with that premise, but I mean, I can understand why some people would feel that way. Um, coming up this week, there is no court tomorrow. Uh, Lindsay Blake's father died unexpectedly. And I believe that tomorrow is his funeral. So we will have the day off. Um, Colby was in town on Friday, but not in court. Um, he was spotted leaving a bit earlier, wearing a nice a crisp white shirt and a tie walking with an escort. And so I'm going to assume that he will, we still have to finish Dulema's testimony. We did not finish that. And I assume that Colby will be possibly testifying Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. We'll see probably Tuesday. Any, you, you know, you, you know, Colby, you've talked to Colby. You haven't talked to him in a while. I understand that. Yeah. Um, but any yeah, I haven't talked to him since he's gone through a separation and a divorce and some criminal charges that were dropped. Were just, that were dropped. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's been a while. 
Yeah. Um, any thoughts on what that would that might be like for both of them? Uh, you know, Colby has had a very close relationship with his mother, so I, uh, I, I think that Colby has changed his relationship with Lori quite a bit. I think that he's probably, I know when I talked to him, he was extremely angry with her. I think he's come to terms with a lot of what's happened. I think he blames her and there's probably still some anger. So, uh, but, but in spite of all that, they were extremely close for so many years that it's got to be difficult for him to take the stand. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of turmoil. There's going to be a lot of inner turmoil when he takes the stand and it's, it's just going to be, it's going to be very, very hard for him. And, and for anybody in that position, I would think so. I mean, it's still his mother, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of victims of abuse over the years. And one of the things that comes up consistently and perpetually is that victims always want to see or reconnect many of them, not all, but many victims want to reconnect with their parents, even though their parents have been abusive. And so it's just human beings crave connection and we crave closeness and even kids that are abused, they need that. And if their parents are abusive, sometimes they're loving at other times. And it's, so it's, it's difficult to sometimes figure out. And he's had so much loss even recently. Yeah. Yeah. So is there still love there? Yeah, I'm sure. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, I think it's going to be emotionally taxing for him and it's, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, Blue Sky mentions that, yeah, she thinks it might be Lori's hardest day in court. And I yeah. imagine it might be because, yes, uh, Colby has sort of been her person, you know. Yeah. Well, there's this interesting memory I have at the beginning of this trial um, that I noticed right away. Not Excuse me, not the beginning of this trial. The beginning of this case when the children were still missing. I was I was in from the beginning. And I remember when Colby made a YouTube video pleading with his mother to let him know where the children were, where his brother and sister were. And I recognized from Colby something that was really interesting. He was pleading with his mother in a very apologetic way. Mom, I'm not trying to hurt you. Mom, I'm not saying I did anything wrong. Mom, I'm not saying that you are the person that did something bad. Mom, tell me where the kids are. Look, I love you. It was very interesting. It was like I could see their relationship by the way he spoke on this YouTube video that he was, he had to keep reassuring his mother while demanding that she let him know where his brother and sister were. And I can see that Colby has walked on eggshells for a long time. I guess that's what yeah. I'm trying to say. The, the side of Colby that I saw a few years ago was more of an angry Colby. And he was, I think he just, he wanted an explanation and he wanted his mother to take responsibility and she clearly wasn't going to. And so he became, he would become angrier when she wouldn't accept responsibility. And he, he just wanted her to acknowledge what she did. And I think he was looking for, if she could acknowledge that, I think he thought that that might give him a little bit of closure. So that's all he wanted. When I talked to him, that's what he would tell me. He's like, I just want the truth. You know, I'm tired of dancing around this fiction or this fantasy world. Like, I just I just want her to face reality. And, and again, that's kind of what we saw. That's what you saw on Tuesday. The avoidance of her facing it almost. Right, the avoidance. The, and there's this perpetual avoidance. And so this question here by Artful Betsy. Uh, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because I, I would say kind of none of the Art above. Really quickly, Artsy Betsy is asking, is it possible Lori asked to leave the court primarily out of shame and embarrassment rather than any uh, guilt, sorrow, or remorse? So go ahead, David. I'm not sure the, that she experiences a lot of sorrow or remorse or shame. I mean, there's shame there, but uh, again, I, th I think she's probably, she wanted to leave because it's, it's sort of a flight reaction. She's, she's overwhelmed by the stressor that's really challenging her defenses, and it's a threat. I think it's it's a it's a threat to her worldview. 
and her beliefs about the apocalypse. And it's a threat to even at the deepest level, it's a threat to her very integrity, the very integrity of herself. Because the integrity of herself is so tied up with her beliefs that if she's allows herself to believe that the children weren't evil spirits and that they were in fact normal kids who deserve to be alive today, then all of those things would be under threat. Yeah. It's going to be, I think a heavy beginning of next week. If, if, you know, yeah, it's going to be a heavy day. And of course, uh, we'll be live tweeting from uh, twitter.com slash hidden to crime directly after court. We will have the audio. I know that earlier on last week um, exhibits were entered into court uh, phone calls. One of them was a phone call between Lori and Colby. So I assume that will be entered. I don't know if that will be the one we heard on Netflix, you know, or yeah, there's, there's something multiple, else. There's been multiple calls that he's recorded. I think the last one he actually, I don't remember if they played the second one on Netflix, but the second one was a ver it was a version of the first essentially. And it, it continued this theme of anger and her being in denial and yeah. So yeah, I, it would be interesting. It'll be very interesting to me to see where Colby is emotionally and psychologically at the moment. I'm sure that his divorce has not been helpful to his mental health. So I hope he's doing okay. I'd like to reconnect with him at some point soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Babe. Thank you for talking to us all about this. Um, we yeah. couldn't let that moment go. We didn't, we didn't even touch upon it last night. So I think it was important for us to go revisit it. And, you know, as an aside, just you telling me about the pictures and you expressing concerns that the JJ may have been alive or, you know, that, that, that it, it may he have been a real suffered. Yeah. Was that was very emotional to me too. You know, I, I've like you, I've been invested in this case for a while and we have, have become close to some of the, some of the major players in this case. And, you know, JJ in particular has always been close to my heart because we have a son that's very young too, that's similar age. And uh, I, I wasn't there to see it, but I, it was very emotional to me too. So just you describing it and just the reality of it after all those years was really difficult to hear and very emotional for me too. So yeah. Uh, one last question. The Cox family is not present in court. Um, is there a similar reason, an avoidance, uh, um, not wanting to feel things, or is this more of an avoidance of shame and not wanting the public to see them? Is this? I think the, the Cox family has been invested in, sort of like the Murdoch family, they've been invested in this ideal of perfection and the perfect family. And, you know, in the, in the perfect family, you don't, you don't have a daughter who does this type of thing. So uh, yeah, I think it would be deeply embarrassing and shameful for them to, to sit there and listen to the testimony and to perhaps have to acknowledge that Lori was, caught up in this. And even though they might say, Hey, look, this isn't what we believe. And they might try to distance themselves from her. The reality is that she was very, very close to that family that and by some accounts that she, she sort of ran the family. She had a leadership role in the family. Right. So now, now they would have to change that whole narrative and, and kind of disown their past perceptions of her and how close she was and how she dictated so many terms and elements of that family. And so, I, yeah, I, I, I would imagine that they just don't want to deal like Lori, they don't want to deal with the reality of what's occurring there. Yeah. Right. And of course, uh, blue sky is asking, you know, the Daybell children have also not been here. 
course, this is um, not Chad's trial. It's Lori's right. trial. But, you know, they have it seems to have gone with the narrative that Lori framed their father. Um, yeah, that's what that's what they said in their national interview. And I, I think they it seems like they've bought into the idea. I mean, we don't know for sure. They're not talking about it, obviously, but they bought into the idea that her that Tammy's death was natural causes. That's yeah. what Chad says, even though clearly the coroner disagrees with that. So again, I don't, you know, you're, there's, there's levels and levels of denial and defense mechanisms throughout so many players in this drama. You know, it's how do you introduce some dose of reality into this situation? I, you know, again, that's, I think that's, what's fascinating here is that there's so many layers of fantasy and denial and, you know, an inability to really process the world accurately. Yeah. Um, one last question. Although Jason Rowe is here and he says he only hangs out with Jack Mormons. They are much more fun. I just want to know if he's related to Julie Rowe. Um, that's my <laughs> only question for Jason Rowe. Uh I can't remember what I was going to ask. Oh, I was just going to mention, someone mentioned Summer. I do believe that Summer Shiflet, who is Lori's sister, will be testifying later. They also entered into evidence a phone call between Summer and Lori. So I assume that will come later. Yeah. All right. Uh, that'll be interesting. All right. Well, thank you. I'm waiting for uh, Jason or to answer. He's not. Um, oh, perhaps cousins, he says. Perhaps. I think you would know if you were Julie Rose's cousin. So, I'm going to suggest maybe right. not. All the, if he was a cousin, all the camping trips where he had to listen to her apocalyptic stories would be unforgettable, I would imagine. I, I imagine. I imagine it would be, you would know if, uh, I would know if I was related to Julie Rowe. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. I am working on a, um introduction episode. I've said this a few times, but I really am on the Lori Vallow Daybell case. And then we're going to also start posting the audio to our podcast soon. But right now everything is on YouTube, youtube.com slash hidden true crime. Subscribe, please subscribe. It means so much to us. Even if you think you don't need the notifications, subscribe to support us during this um, big month, month and a half. Um, while we cover this trial uh, again, I'll be doing lunch lives. Uh, live tweeting and uh, audio streaming. No, and I and I just rhymed. Um, but uh, thank you for um, being here with us during this journey, and thank you, John, for joining us. This yeah, night. absolutely. You need to get to bed. I want to thank our gems for for being up so late, and you know this was the impromptu live for us. We just jumped on at the last minute because we felt like we really couldn't let that moment slip away without discussing it or analyzing it. So, and it, it's, it's such an important moment for understanding Lori, I think too, during this trial. Yes. You know, what could be, what could be more indicative of her mental health or her state of mind than introducing something so graphic and something so important to this trial and looking at the way she responded to it. Yeah. I was on Mormon stories earlier today. We did a three hour podcast over at Mormon stories. If you guys want to see that as well, uh, head to our community posts for those two parts. If you're interested, we went over everything that happened last week. All right. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for uh, following along with us. Uh, thank you for the mini introducing yourself at the trial. Um, we'll, we'll see you guys next week. All right. So, Take care. Thank you. Take care. Good night.